So where are we, where are we now in the course? So we had the first day of the introduction of the plan, sort of all the things that typically go into a plan with the idea that it's not so much the plan, it's the planning of how you're going to answer those kind of questions. Uh, and then Steve Peirce came in and talked about the pitch, how you're going to, what you have to convey so that right from the beginning you're thinking about what do I have to boil this down to. And then we had Bob Jones talking about customer and uh, you know how to, how to find the customer, what kind of customers to look like for the kind of companies that you're likely to, to launch. And then we had a little bit of discussion on the tech strategy last night, trying to figure out, you know, where, what kind of product, where's the, where is the uh, technology relative to the opportunity. So you've done all of that homework, and now the question is, tonight we're going to explore, well, can you make money? And so the first part of the evening is going to be about business models. Uh, what kind of model do you have to have in order to make money from this customer that you've identified and the product that you think you can, or service you can take to market? And that's sort of a conceptual thing. What kind of model do we want to do? So if you think of Google at the beginning, uh, they were a search engine, but it took a few years before they actually got to a model that actually turned them into such a valuable company. Part of that deciding whether that model works, though, is you've got to be able to model it in a financial way. So the second half of the evening, we're going to take and look at different financial uh, projections that relate to a various business model. So by the end of the day, you'll at least have a framework for thinking about what a business model is and how to translate that into financial and then back to look at business models. So that's, that's the goal for tonight. So our first speaker on business models is Rich Kibble. Rich has been one of our uh, volunteers in this course for a number of years, as are all our highly paid speakers. <laughs> um, I'll let him introduce himself. He's very good at that. And uh, Rich, tell us about business models. Great job, thank you. Good, oh, good evening, everybody. It's, it's fun to be back. I've done this class, uh, I don't know how many years now, uh, with Joe and with Charlie. And uh, it's amazing to me just how much the class continues to change because business models continue to change. When I reflect back on what we were talking about a number of years ago, compared to what are the most innovative, creative, profitable business models today. Uh, it's, it's incredible, it's only been a handful of years. Uh, the world continues to change and business models drive business. It's, it is not your business, but it's an important component of it. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today and as Joe said, uh, then pass it over to Charlie. Um, I'll share a little bit with my background, uh, about my background just so there's a, a foundation um, I started my career in technology uh, back in the days when, when rack servers and internet storage was all uh, the rage and uh, worked in the fields of software databases, networks, um, internet service providers and things of this nature. Um, and did both public and private companies in that sector. And then uh, going back about 10 years ago, uh, made a shift. Uh, decided I wanted to try something new and exciting, uh, something I, had n I knew nothing about, and I moved into biotech uh, in sort of an interesting way. I wound up moving into biotech, um, running a bioinformatics company that spun out of MIT. Uh, this is a company that uh, was sort of harnessing the power of the Human Genome Project, which was the biggest thing happening in 1999, 2000, 2001. Uh, mapping of the human genome created incredible amounts of data, just breathtaking amounts of data, and no one knew really what to do with the data. So there was this emergence of companies that were focused around informatics and what we call bioinformatics, which is the ability to sort of capture, store, analyze, and visualize that data. Uh, so this is a very cool company, it spun out of MIT, was in the MIT competition back in those days. It was the MIT 50K competition. Um, and uh, I spent 10 years in biotech running uh, companies uh, that ranged from informatics to diagnostics to therapeutics. Uh, and uh, those, the three big companies were MolecularWare, which is the first one. Uh, then I ran a company in London for three years called Therogenetics, which was in the area of pharmacogenetic diagnostics, which is the ability to look at your, your genes and predict the probability that you'll respond to a drug, and then moved into uh, another company in the field of vaccines, which is called Rhapsody Biologics, where I, I still currently serve as chairman, uh, and that's a Singaporean-based company. 
uh, focused around a platform for vaccines. Now, I tell you this uh, based on the foundation of I have virtually no scientific experience or training. Um, so you can imagine that what I was hired for was understanding how to build a business. And when you think about those different businesses, uh, being in the service industry and in technology, hosting, you think about then moving into informatics, selling essentially software systems to large labs, moving into diagnostics where we had to deal with reimbursement, regulatory, and dealing with both clinicians as well as patients, and then moving into the field of vaccines where you're dealing not only with physicians and patients and regulatory, but you're also dealing with very much governmental organizations that are providing vaccines around the world. So those are incredibly different business models uh, that range in every spectrum from the standpoint of probability of success, profitability, and scalability. Um, this past year, uh, I guess I figured 10 years, I got, I got the itch to do something new. Uh, so this past summer, uh, I made a, rad a radical shift and moved over to what many of my friends call the dark side. So I moved into the world of finance and uh, joined uh, as a senior manager at a firm in Westwood, Connecticut, that some of you may have heard of called Bridgewater Associates, um, which is ranked as uh, the number one performing and also the largest hedge fund in the world. So you can imagine we have a totally different business model uh, at a place like Bridgewater where we manage about $125 billion and we only have about 200 clients. But our clients are sovereign wealth funds, governments, municipalities, huge pension endowments and things of that nature. Uh, so again, a new business model and a new business. So uh, it's emerging. So I wanted to uh, just give you that as a foundation and then talk a little bit today around business models and how I think about those. Let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, so I want to start off from an academic perspective and let's just define this. There's lots of definitions around what is a business model, what is a good business model, but essentially this is the simplest definition I can find. It's a method by which a firm uses its resources, it doesn't matter whether it's cash, technology, people, to offer customers better value than its competitors, make money doing it. Your business model should be very simple. You should tell who pays, how much, and how often. And that's critical, and I'm going to continue to return to that theme around simplicity is really elegant. When you look at the most successful companies, you'll find their business models are far less complex than you might think. Complexity in business models creates massive disruption, not only in the marketplace, and you're not really meant to read this slide. Uh, <laughs> it's, it really creates disruption not only in the marketplace, but it creates disruption within the company where you're managing multiple business models at a single period of time, having different types of clients and pain points. And it really creates challenges, especially with fast growth companies. So simplicity, sort of the elegance of, of bringing really complex points together or clients to a product or to a service and simplifying it is really critical. And what I'm going to talk about today is how do you think about business models? How do you think about building them? And also what type of models are appropriate? And I'm also going to just mix in some examples um, of how all of us are impacted in our day-to-day -day lives with products and services that are sold in different ways. So I want to stress two key points. Um, and it's interesting, one of the things uh, Joe and I talked about prior to, to this year's class uh, was a new book uh, that had come out specifically around uh, business models. And I thought some of the learnings in there would be worth sharing and uh, two of the key points I found uh, that were really foundational was, number one, your business model is not your business. It is not the end-all, be-all. And quite frankly, business model innovation is critical to developing quality business, attacking new markets, and driving profitability. If you build your business based around just your technology or just your business model without innovating both, it will likely fail. Now, it'll fail for lots of reasons, adoption, competitors, and lots of different things. But you must remember that innovation and sort of evolution of your business model is absolutely critical. Think about the companies that we have touching our lives every day and how they've modified and moved their business models to creative ways. Think about uh, the concept around ordering electronics. 
where the only way to purchase acquired electronics a number of years ago was to walk into a big box retailer. And prior to that, it was a small box retailer with very limited selection. And then came the Best Buys and the Circuit Cities and others. And then you see this shift where most people, every bit of electronics they own was probably purchased online. And then you see other shifts that are happening in that field. And you can look at that from almost any industry perspective. The ability to innovate your business model is critical. So I'm going to touch upon this in a few different ways. And if you have questions, feel free to just like raise a hand, interrupt. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, so while it's fresh in your mind, feel free to uh, feel free to just let me know. That's a great idea. Good. So just raise your hand, and uh, then if you can come down to the mic. If not, just holler it out, and I'll repeat the question for the group. So I think about business models as different components, and a business model has lots of different pieces. These slides, by the way, will be available. Um, so you don't, I see lots of people scribbling. Uh, they'll all be available up on the site. Um, these seven components are how I really think about what you need to think about as a business leader. So I take it from the perspective of a CEO or an entrepreneur. If you came to me and said, Rich, listen, we really want to get your perspective. We're launching a new company. This is the product. This is what we think about from a standpoint of manufacturing, clients. This checklist is critical. You think about the value proposition, what are you doing, the market segment, value chain structure, position in that value chain structure and within that network. And then, of course, out of that will hopefully come revenue generation with a focus on margins, competitive strategy in order to stay ahead. And all of this is based on another component which is the stage of development of your business. The, the way your business runs today, when you might have dozens of people or hundreds of people, is much different than it will run as it emerges and enters new markets. So the stage of development can also impact how you evolve that model. So I'm going to touch upon each of these really quick, and then we're going to use some examples around this. Uh, so foundationally, you've got the value proposition. Uh, this is sort of the crux of it all, isn't it? How many people in here are engaged with the uh, MIT 100K competition? Excellent. So as you go through that process of taking classes like this and working with teams, looking at how you build a business from scratch, getting mentorship, and then also getting feedback from the judges, as one of the judges, I can tell you that the value proposition is one of the foundational aspects of each business. Unfortunately, a lot of people think it's the technology. And I think in places like MIT, you know, we're also so technology focused that there's a belief that if the technology is the best, it's going to win in the market. And there's lots of examples of where that's just quite frankly not true. So the value proposition is sort of the foundation for everything. It's a description of what the customer has as a pain point, the solution that you are creating and how it's going to actually impact that pain point, and the value of that solution from the customer's perspective. So you may be selling the greatest device in the world, and you think it's solving a problem, but you need to verify that that product or service that you're offering is actually solving the problem the way the client wants it solved. So what is your client value? And part of it might be rather uh, discreet or hidden initially, and you need to do client surveys, you need to do market surveys, or it might be very clear as you can see the marketplace. But think about what your client values, or what they could value, and it could be price, it could be speed, it could be design, it could be quality of service, it could be all of those things. And your business model, foundation, and value proposition needs to be based on that. Um, market segmentation, I'm going to go through some of these really quick, uh, is really about targeting the proper audience. So if I'm selling high-end computer system, computer systems and boxes, and along with that is service, I have to think about what is the value proposition, what am I providing to that client, is that client looking for price, are they looking for speed, are they looking for design, are they looking for innovation, service. Once I understand that, I then can think about my market segment in a better way. I can then take that and chop it into pieces and think about, all right, I'm going to target the Fortune 1000 companies first, or I'm going to target emerging growth companies. I can think about market segmentation in a very creative way which is also a way for me as a CEO to efficiently attack a market and use my resources the way they should be used. Value chain structure is another component of this. As we all know, each of the products that 
we, we use in our daily basis, whether it be the clothes we wear or the, the products in our homes or our apartments or the electronics we have, um, all of them came through a series of chains. And it might have been delivery chains, retail chains, there's other mechanisms. So you have to think about what the chain structure is within your business, within, I should say, your industry, and then think about how you're going to operate within that chain. If you decided you wanted to create Amazon, an example that's been used a few times, I want to, you think about Amazon originally set up and they wanted to sell books. Well, the chain structure, when Amazon first started, was completely different than the structure Amazon was proposing. The chain structure dealt with large manufacturers of books, publishers of books, who then shipped to distributors, who then shipped to bookstores, and those bookstores, by and large, sold to the individuals, the clients. Amazon turned that completely on its head and shifted away from the retailer model and built relationships directly with the publishers of those books and created a series of new ways to operate within that value chain. So this alone is a component of their business model that gave them an advantage to operate in a new way. They still had to execute and do lots of other things, but that was one of the things that they did. Something Amazon then went on to do, uh, what's, what's a different business that you could think of that Amazon moved into that would be a dramatic departure from selling books online? Excuse me? Cloud computing. What are some of the other things that they did as well? They don't just sell books, do they? They sell electronics. They sell a whole series of other things. What else? Virtually everything, right? So what they did is, can you imagine if they tried to present all of those things when they first aligned their business and started it? The complexity would be too severe. It'd be very hard to capture true value from the market and understand your marketplace. They did it in a very methodical way. They did it in such a way that they were able to dominate a space around online book sales, build a sustainable business, which allowed them to move into online sales of other products and services that were far outside of books. So you can imagine just that impact. They now have to think about new retail chains, excuse me, new distribution channels. Instead of actually dealing with publishers, many of whom are based in the United States, they're dealing with electronic retailers, many of whom are based, based in Asia or elsewhere. It was an entirely different business model, and they were able to leverage their brand in order to do that because they had that penetration in the market. The cloud computing piece of it is just incredibly elegant. They recognized that the amount of data and information they were storing, the amount of information they were able to use to better run their business was becoming so overwhelming that they needed to create quality systems, operations, controls, software programs to run that. They wanted to be able to do predictive uh, modeling where an individual that bought a particular book could also be referenced to other products or services, a particular type of music or a particular um, class of other types of music or books. That predictive modeling was all built by Amazon. So what they realized is that they were building both infrastructure and intelligence that was fantastic for their business, but they recognized that there was other needs within the global economy that they could they could solve those problems. There were other issues out there that companies were facing that didn't have the infrastructure. And they have then built, essentially, one of the world's largest cloud computing platforms and continue to grow based on that. So it's a fantastic model. You can look at other companies where they've shifted. Think about uh, people here are familiar with iRobot. So if you ever had the privilege of listening to Helen uh, Greiner talk about iRobot and the growth of that company, it's fascinating to think about how they thought through the concepts of building high-quality, high-touch, high-complexity robots. And over a period of years, they've evolved to a company that now has a tremendous revenue stream coming from the US government and other governmental institutions to create robotics that actually save lives, can be operated remotely, go into very complex situations with high chemicals, high explosives, or high volatility, and at the same time, they sell the Roomba. A little robot that will clean your floor, zip around your house, scare the hell out of your pets. I mean, can you imagine the complexity of those two business streams? Governmental sales, 
super long sales cycle, bureaucracy, bidding, open, and going through a retail channel. The growth into those, just like Amazon did, was through thoughtful innovation, thinking about where they stood within the value chain and the position in the value network. So I'll continue. Um, revenue generation and margin, you all know what that is. That's important unless you work in biotech or pharmaceutical. We do not make any money. We just spend gobs of investor money. And then if the drug gets approved, we all get rich. And the challenge is about 13 years. So I'm not going to uh, really build a good case study for the biopharma industry around uh, revenue generation and margins. We usually skip right over that. Uh, so competitive strategy is a big piece of this. So I'm going to change channels for just a quick second and ask you to think about customer segments for a moment. Because I talked about sort of those seven pieces, value proposition, market segmentation, value chain. But now take a step back and think about a few other things. Think about the way customers are approached. And this becomes an important component of your business model. So if you take any one of these, so think about mass marketing. Who can give me an example of mass market business models? What would be an example of a mass market business model? Okay, so Coca-Cola. So the mass market side concept is that basically they're looking for a really large group of clients. So it's a mass market, and it's pretty much the same product, or two or three. Right? That's a good example. Um, what about from a niche market perspective? Who's got a good example of a niche market that's actually paying off? Or one that exists? Okay, that's actually interesting. So you've actually touched upon two niche markets, right? So that's a really good point. So you have, uh, she said clothes, clothing, that would be really expensive or made from uh, renewable or organic uh, type materials, um, which in itself is actually two different niche markets, right? So you can go into Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom or Barney's and buy really, really expensive clothes. And you can go into a, a boutique and buy really sort of cool organic clothes are made from hemp and other products, it can actually be two different market segments. And you have to think about that in a quality way. You have to think about, hey, we want to build high-end, sort of earthy, crunchy products or clothing. And that's a tough balance, right? Because your market um, may not be both high-end and earthy, crunchy. So that's an interesting way to think about the uh, sort of dynamics of customer segmentation. Most companies might choose one or the other. So they might choose, they're going to build their brand around super high-end um, product lines, and then they may merge into serving the more organic needs of a different market segment or vice versa. That, that's a great example. Uh, what's another good example of a niche market that's non-retail? It's a little bit harder. Think about niche market, non-retail. That's definitely a niche market. Highly retail, though. Really retail-driven, right? Okay, again, it's retail. You're getting warmer, though. That's a niche market, okay? That's very good. So you're now actually thinking about this is equipment that can be purchased by a limited number of users, right? Hospital beds, probably not a big retail market for that. You won't see a hospital bed store opening up in the local mall. But they know what their defined market is. They're able to say, okay, there's 750 hospitals in New England. These are the types of hospitals. How often do people buy hospital beds? Well, they might turn them over every 10 years. They can start rationalizing how they can penetrate the market and so forth, right? So that's a good example. And there's lots of other examples of medical equipment. Here's the timeshares, like condominium timeshares. That's interesting. So there you're going after perhaps what type of, uh, when you think about customer segmentation, if you were, uh, a developer, you were going to build a new timeshare community somewhere. Yeah. So you would have a very specific niche market segment. What about, uh, I see lots of laptops here. Think about the laptop you have sitting in front of you right now. It was bought through a retail environment, right? So somewhat niche, but kind of mass market, wouldn't you agree? Pretty mass market. I mean, I see lots of Apple. See lots of Dell. Think about the components within that laptop. The keyboard, 
the mouse, the touch screen, the glass on the screen itself. Each one of those, for the most part, are highly successful companies. They build relationships with very large, multi-billion dollar companies. But that is a niche, isn't it? If you could find a way to build the next best flat screen, or the next best mouse, or a new way of operating, and you're going to sell through, that becomes really a niche. Auto parts uh, are an example of that. It made me think of it when we were talking about when you mentioned luxury cars. So think about all the buttons and dials and little motors that are inside of your car, the motor that moves the mirrors that makes them fold in, or the motor that makes the seat recline, the heater that's in the seat. Each one of those represents a business, a product from a business that has a specific market segmentation. And I just wanted to spend a little more time on it. So often we talk about retail, but the niche market can range in different ways. Um, segmented markets and diversified markets are all different. Segmented markets would be, um, a good example of that would be banks. Where the market is segmented, the bank has an objective, which is basically to get more clients in the bank. And they may segment their market in different ways. So if you're Morgan Stanley, you may say, well, we're going to segment our market, high net worth individuals and general retail. So anybody can open up an account here, no real minimum requirement, but we have a special segmentation for high net worth individuals with account balances greater than X. That's one example. Um, another model is sort of the diversified model, which is when you have really unrelated segments. And I won't spend too much time on this because I think Amazon that we talked about earlier is probably one of the great examples of that. When you think about this diversified model where they not only have the retail book sales, but they're also doing cloud computing sales and selling to multinational companies, that entire product. And the last one that I would ask you to think about is this sort of multi-sided platform. Um, a good example of this I think a lot of people don't realize exists is uh, the computers you have in front of you, most of which are running Windows. Windows is a good example of a multi-sided platform where Windows can be bought off the retail store, you can download it, right? So if you want to get the new Windows 7 or you want to wind up getting the new PowerPoint, or the new software program from Microsoft, you can download it. That's a retail channel. But at the same time, they're also selling directly to hardware manufacturers. Another example um, of what would be considered multi-sided platforms would be uh, credit card companies. If you're a credit card company, you want to have tons of credit cards on the market, right? You want lots of people carrying around your piece of plastic. You want lots of people charging on that and not paying off their balance every single month, so you earn interest on that. But you also have a whole different side of your market that you have to cater to. Who is that? The merchants, right? So think about that complexity where you've got an entire merchant base. So you have to get merchants to accept that credit card. And by the way, you charge them a transaction fee. So you got to get them to take the credit card. And also, every time you swipe, they, they swipe their uh, client's card, you're going to get a piece of that. So that is a good example of multi-sided, where you've got credit card companies, retail side, and also selling to the merchants. So I thought I'd, that would be a few good examples. Question? Amazon, sells Amazon and eBay. Amazon and eBay. Yeah. Very true. Any other uh, questions or comments? All right, good. Moving along. How am I doing for time, Joe? I'm not out of time yet. Oh, jeez. So I may just do this thing twice. OK, all right, that'll be great. Uh, so to continue, so uh, different type of market customer segments and different models to evaluate. We've talked about the first piece of this. Now I want to drill down a little bit further into the models. And uh, this is where I really think that most people it will resonate, is when we think about the goods and products and services that we have, we got them in different ways. And if you're building a business today and you said to me, Rich, we're building a business that's going to sell medical devices or we're going to wind up selling downloadable software programs or we're going to build a gaming company, the things we've talked about thus far sort of build that foundation, how you're thinking about value prop and market position and how you're thinking about is it going to be to a mass market versus a niche. But even after you've made that leap, so you follow these three strings, it's the value proposition and the initial sort of seven that we talked about. We then think about how are we thinking about our customers. Is it for niche customers? Is it segmented? But then we have to think about how we're going to execute that way into the market. So for example, 
if you're selling to a very niche market, and we used the retail as an example earlier, you have to think about how are you going to penetrate that niche market. So clothing is a good example that everybody can relate to. We all buy clothes, and there's lots of ways to buy clothes. If you're selling into a niche market, if you decided that you're going to build a clothing company that has high levels of customization, custom designs, high quality fabrics, it's going to go to a very high net worth niche client base. Right? That was the first part of our discussion around customer. Uh, now we're thinking about how do we penetrate that marketplace. Are you going to do it online? Are you going to become one of these very high end um, groups that are online selling to niche clients? Are you going to use a retail model? And you're going to do everything you can to get your label, your brand into Neiman Marcus or into other high-end stores? Are you going to think about doing trade shows or conferences? Trade shows would be more appropriate where you're selling your clothes at a trade show to other retailers. Boutiques are coming in to buy those. Uh, I have a friend of mine that does, uh, builds jewelry. She's a jewelry designer. And when she makes her jewelry, she's thinking about the quality of that product and the cost of manufacturing it and what market segment she's going to go to. And she may sell that directly in literally an in-home sort of one-on-one -on -one experience for custom jewelry, or she may sell it through a retailer. But those decisions needed to be made. She hasn't approached the idea um, of selling it on the internet yet. She hasn't approached the idea of doing it through multiple channels where the products are sold through distributors. And it's not that those are bad ideas, it's more of a methodical approach of building that brand and thinking through it in a quality way. In the direct model, uh, there's lots of advantages. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of these quickly because I think you guys are mostly familiar with it, but if you're not, kind of wave the hand. Uh, direct models have great advantages in some ways, which is you get to know your client. If I'm selling these devices to business, and I'm the first one to ever manufacture one of these, a direct model might be a very high quality way of penetrating the market. I'm going to educate the client, they're going to touch it, they're going to feel it, they're going to ask questions. But once there's widespread adoption, and people actually know what my product operates like, well, I can then switch my business model, and perhaps I get to sell these online. Because the adoption is already there. So think about how you approach your sales model or your business model by thinking about emerging and evolving it over a period of time. Direct sales is very good for that. Direct sales also has some downsides. It's incredibly expensive. It's very, very expensive to hire salespeople, train them, bring them up to speed, develop complex compensation plans, worry about them being stolen away. But there's also some risk associated with that. You're highly educating the customer. And if the customer doesn't buy, what you've basically done is prepare them for your competitor by educating them. So think about direct sales as both uh, positives and negatives in all models, but think about the stage of your business. Distribution channels and partners are a great example of uh, another model that's typically lower cost. It's somewhat of a hands-off model. I'll give you an example. Uh, in, uh, when I was running MolecularWare, we were building a software application. And we had more than one distribution channel. Um, but one of them that we used was through distributors and, and what we called partnerships, where we wanted to penetrate Asia. And there were one or two genomic centers there. One of them is the Rican Institute for Genomic Research. That was a client of ours. But we had nowhere uh, near the financial stability um, and experience to begin to operate in Asia in a quality way on our own. We didn't have salespeople in that region. We didn't have the capital to hire, train, and bring those salespeople up to speed. The ability for us to actually penetrate that market was virtually impossible using a direct sales model owned by us. So what we did is we found a channel partner, a distributor. We partnered with a group called CTC based in Tokyo. This is an entire sales team specializing in the biomedical field. We were able to operate in a very quality way by penetrating that market by using an on-the-ground distribution source. Our margins are impacted by that because they're taking a big piece of it, but it allowed us to penetrate a market we would have never otherwise been able to do. OEM channels is another good example. Um, I could actually reflect back on, on molecular wear as an example of this as well. Um, geez, with all of these different ideas, I, I'm surprised that company wasn't more successful. OEM channels is an example of, again, back to computers. Think about uh, the computer you have right now. 
when it says Intel inside or it says Microsoft on the front of it, that is an OEM channel, and OEM is the original equipment manufacturer. One of the things that we did is we realized that our software was essentially capturing, storing, and visualizing data that was coming off of instruments, uh, essentially robotics, things that were doing sample reads in laboratory environments. So we would have to write these scripts that would allow us to operate with different instrument companies. So that allowed us to basically sell our software on a computer. They could hook the computer up to multiple instruments. Right? It could be a pin tool robot, or it could be a, a liquid machine. It could be a freezer that was storing samples. And that would then communicate with that device or that, that piece of hardware. So what we did is we took an OEM approach where we realized that one of the best products out there was a company called BioRobotics, uh, which was based um, on the West Coast, and another company called Applied Precision. And Applied Precision was selling a particular type of instrument, robotic instrument. They had their own software, but their software was pretty crappy. And they were actually losing sales with a superior product, their, their, their hardware. Uh, they were losing sales because their software was bad. We came and replaced their software, so every time they sold an instrument to a lab, we get a royalty. So that's the OEM concept of it. It's hands off, it's very expensive from a margin perspective, but very low cost from the standpoint of managing the business that way, if you have a high quality partner. Any questions thus far? No? Right here? Good question. I'll, I'll repeat that. So he's asking, when you think about these OEM channels or distributor type partnerships, um, are these sort of infinite or are they term relationships? Sort of how do you manage that relationship? Um, so we, we approached it, and each contract is different, um, that this was a one-year renewable contract, um, and it had specific benchmarks uh, that needed to be hit. So we gave uh, both uh, CTC, the labs, uh, the distribution partner in Japan, as well as um, API, Applied Precision, um, very favorable pricing on the software. But they had to hit particular numbers in order to maintain that pricing. So you can imagine you create a model that says, you know, that you're going to get, you know, 40% off up to 100 units. You're going to get 50% off from 100 to 200. You're going to get 60% off from 200 to 1,000 and you create a model where they have a huge incentive to actually perform. And then the contract becomes renewable based on whatever term you ultimately agree. Um, and that's just the best way to manage it. Um, I'm going to point out one other thing that is sort of outside of the contractual piece of this, which is just really negotiating and business development. Um, it's, it's something that uh, we learned a little bit the hard way was I think we anticipated that having an OEM channel or having especially a distributor was going to be more hands-off than, uh, than it ultimately turned out to be. And you'll find that when you find those distributors, especially foreign country distributors, uh, they have lots of options. And essentially, if you can imagine, they have salespeople that are walking around, call it, you know, in theory, with a bag. Right? And it might not be a bag, but they're walking around with something. And they're selling products from multiple companies from around the world. If they don't have a quality relationship with you and your company, if they really don't know your product, if they view it as hard to sell, if they view it as overpriced, if those things, they're just going to sell the next best thing in their bag, right? So they're selling multiple products usually. As a distribution company, that's your business model, right? If you're going to set up a distribution company, you'd want to sell multiple products. Just like if you were going to set up a retailer, you'd want to have multiple products. And those products that are either overpriced or don't resonate with the customers or that are hard to sell, you generally pay less attention to. So one of the things to keep in mind related to both OEM as well as these other channels is although there's an appearance that it's hands off and you sign the contract and then the money comes in, you need to budget for and really think about in order to maintain that relationship there needs to be some sort of a liaison between your company and theirs. There needs to be regular communication. And that is really critical because ultimately, the success or failure of that relationship is going to determine on how, 
how uh, easy your product is to sell, how it's priced, and that's going to incentivize their people. So good question, and it made me think of that other component of it. Any other questions up to this point? Oh, great. So your question is, what's the difference between selling a component or what was the second piece of it? So what's the difference between Yep. Okay, so let's stick with one example, right? So let's say if you have a good software idea. Um, what's the difference between, you were asking an either or, which is the difference between selling it, what, direct on your own, or what were you? Yep. Um, so using, I'll use software as an example just because I, I can at least base it in, in my own experience. Um, the primary difference between using, let's say, a distributor channel versus an OEM channel, if I'm the manufacturer of the software, um, I need to think about integration and also my ability for around, uh, call it a, a sort of competitive expansion. If I'm selling through a channel, they are given a marketplace, usually geographically focused, and their goal is to capture a massive amount of market share. And they're going to sell to everyone within that market. And once that term is over, I can switch very easily to another distributor in that marketplace if they're failing. And I can also bring on multiple distributors. So I might have a Northeast Asia distributor, and I might have a Southeast Asia distributor, and then I'll have someone else in you know, parts of Europe that's not necessarily covering the UK. So I have multiple distributors, and I can hire and fire them, and they can hire and fire me, essentially. They can stop carrying my products as our business model, or as our businesses emerge. Uh, but if I sign a relationship with an OEM manufacturer, I am now locked in. I have to integrate my product into their system. I also have to modify my product in order to stay compliant with their system. How many of us have dealt with that wonderful experience? When you download a new software program, but your hardware is not quite up to speed, or you decide to have a brand new uh, laptop and you try to install software that you bought a year and a half ago and it doesn't work right. So think about that's part of the challenge technically, is you now are being governed by the speed at which your OEM partner evolves, right? So if I'm building car parts, and I'm working with Chevy, and Chevy changes the model, and now all the handles go in and out instead of up and down, and that's their new design, I have to change the way I operate in order to accommodate that versus somebody that's selling something directly uh, you know, through, through a distribution channel where I'm not tied to that hardware or to that, that component. Um, so does that make sense? You have some... It, yes, you're conforming to the market, but that's different than conforming to design changes, right, as an example. Uh, the other piece of this, I, the other string, does that make sense, everybody? Because sometimes I'm, I capture these strings and then I start going all over. And, uh, the other string I want to sort of pull on here that, that uh, might make sense from a risk perspective, right? So going back to your question, hey, if I'm building a software, what's the difference between me selling it through a hardware product an OEM versus, let's say, through other channels or distributors or retail. Um, the other piece is competitive. Um, that if you have a relationship very often with a hardware manufacturer, and this is a good example of molecularware where we had the relationship with Applied Precision, we had to think very carefully as we signed that contract because it precluded us from selling to other hardware manufacturers that directly competed with them. So they had a particular type of device that was sold to a very large marketplace, and there were two or three other competitors. And believe me, we would have loved to have had all of them as clients. But we lacked the leverage uh, at the time as a startup company 
uh, to leave an open contract where we could pretty much sell to everyone. Versus, let's say, Microsoft, right, who can sell through Dell computers, Visio computers, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so they wouldn't lock themselves into uh, such a relationship. So that can be a prohibiting factor about how you think about it. Right? So it's how long are you locked into this, and also how do you have to evolve um, your product in order to keep up with their design changes. Good. Other questions? No? All right. Uh, so th as I sort of close this out and then open up to, to sort of Q&A is, is how do you think about the business models and why? So I sort of try to set a foundation here. Um, and I want to now get down to sort of the granular different discussions. And we've already touched upon a few of these, uh, so I probably won't go over them all. Uh, but as you look at this sort of list here, these are companies that are essentially competing in the same sphere, right? They might be competing for the same customer. They might have similar competitors. They might be going after that same niche, right? So if you think about the niche markets that are out there and different levels within that. Um, so I'd like you just to take a look at that list and think about what is the different business model that these companies that on the surface appear so similar but in actuality are so different. So who's heard of uh, the cell phone company uh, manufacturer named Virtu? Okay. So anybody here have a ballpark, what does a Virtu phone cost? $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. It's a phone, right? It's a cell phone. I can go into AT&T and walk out with a Nokia, and if I sign a two-year contract, they give me the phone for free. So think about that. These guys are essentially selling products that, by and large, if you saw them sitting on the desk and you didn't know one was a Virtu and one was a Nokia, you took those names off, you couldn't really tell what their business model is, their strategy, their positioning. They're both very cool looking. But Virtu, as an example, decided that they were going to go to the super uber high-end market and sell phones that have high-quality metals, materials, um, precious stones and other things that are part of that that device, and they sell them literally for tens of thousands of dollars. Versus Nokia, as an example. Um, I'll use a few other examples here. Think about uh, in the watch world. Uh, watches range from literally your Swatch watch. It's made of usually products like plastics, rubbers, very, very, very inexpensive metals. Or you have these custom-made watches like a Patek or IWC, that these watches are made by hand and might take a year of man hours to build that watch. So it's not just enough to say, I'm going to build a new kind of watch company. It's how are you thinking about your business model? What kind of company do you want to become? Who is your market? How do you think about the niche and the subgroups? And then even how to distribute it. That's all part of your business model. If I'm going to create a high-end watch company that's building custom-made watches with precious metals and stones, I have to think about how I'm going to distribute that, how I'm going to manufacture it, how I'm going to communicate with the marketplace, and how do I target my clients, as opposed to I'm going to wind up building the next Timex that's going to be a mass market. Does that make sense? Another great example I, I, I actually got out of the book that Joe recommended to me is uh, Skype, which if you think about Skype, it's probably one of the most innovative business models out there. This is a company that essentially is doing something that all of us take for granted and use every day, which is telecommunications. It decided to do it in a relatively unique way, but not an incredibly unique way. I mean, they didn't invent the internet. They just figured out a way to create a company using voice over IP and being able to use the internet to facilitate communication. And this is a company that has gone on to create tremendous revenue returns for investors and others. And they are directly in the same market as someone like AT&T. So think about just how varied those business models are. When you think about a company that is online only, the way they actually make money is when you go and you put money into your account, and that is used to call landlines. But you're welcome to download the product, service directly to your computer, and call people over the internet at no cost. It's fascinating. So that's a great example of a new innovative business model, also harnessing new technology 
and competing against essentially these 100, 150, 120 year old companies that have been doing the same thing. And one of the reasons they're so competitive, well, actually I won't say, why do you think, what do you think one of the great reasons that they're so competitive and they have such good margins? What kind of costs are they eliminating? The hardware cost, the cost of actually maintaining phone lines, all of those things that essentially creates the infrastructure of a telecommunications company. Okay. Yeah. Actually, really, that's, that's, a, that's a fascinating point I had not even considered, which is they're not regionalized, right? So AT&T has its limitations associated with what region it's in. And they're competing against Sprint. And in the cellular market, they're competing with a lot of other people as well. Um, but AT&T is not in the UK. And they're not in Asia. But Skype is everywhere. And my brother, who lives in Delhi, I can Skype with him on a regular basis. And my cost is relatively zero. I can Skype with him on Skype, or I can call his landline for a very, very fractional cost. And if I ever picked up my home phone, which is AT&T, and call him on his landline, the cost would be just massive because you lack that ability to actually go across border. Uh, that was a, that's a great example. I had not thought of that earlier. Any other comments, thoughts on these? Or questions? Like, why are these two up here? You know, why are these side by side? Okay, so we'll, we'll leave the Dell sort of uh, balance sheet off the table, right? Uh, because that's that, that's representative of their business model, but it's not their business model, right? Um, so I, I, I think you could actually parse this in a lot of interesting ways. Um, and the reason Apple and Dell are on there, uh, and his question was really like, what are, what are we trying to illustrate? What am I trying to illustrate by putting that up on the slide? Um, the business models of Apple and Dell are just fascinating in that Dell, uh, and, and please challenge me on this if you don't agree, but Dell really was the innovator around custom designed, really personalized computers sold over the internet. That was, that, I mean, have you ever been to the Dell store? I don't know if there is a Dell store, right? They were selling over the internet, highly sort of a viral sort of concept of, I get to go online, I can pick now, I can pick the color of my, uh, case, I can customize the software, I can decide what components, how many inputs I have, do I have an external drive, and it, it, all of those things. They really innovated in an incredible way by basically saying that we're going to do this faster and in a cheaper way than others. When at the same time, their competitors, when Dell was launching, they really were not competing with Apple at all. They were competing against HP, they were competing against IBM, they were competing against some of these emerging sort of, uh, companies that were building cheap computers. Um, and all of those companies were primarily selling through retail. So you would go into your Best Buy or your Costco, or you would go into a retail store, and there would be light out, you know, your Sony Vio and these other computers. Or you could buy a Dell, which wasn't available there, but you would buy it online in most cases. So what they did is they created an innovative business model that allowed them to succeed. Apple, right, as they began to emerge and attack new markets, they did a few interesting things. Well, they decided to compete with Dell, uh, certainly on the online market. That was like a no-brainer. Much less customization, right? But what they did, which has really just changed the face of retail, is they went and started selling in malls and building their own stores. And they created an atmosphere within their stores where people wanted to go. I mean, I think all of us have been inside of an Apple store. Whether we use Apple uh, computers or not, you probably have an iPhone or an iPod. You go into that store, it's just like a super cool place to be. I mean, it's like going to Starbucks. When Starbucks first opened up, it was like, wow, this is like a cool little place to be. You sit on the leather couch, read the newspaper, hang out with your friends. That was a great business model. And Apple said another way to compete in the market, they knew their demographic, was we're going to go to the retail, but they didn't think about it the way everybody else thought about it, which is we're going to go buy shelf space at Best Buy. They said, we're going to build a super cool place with really smart, nerdy people that are going to be very, very helpful. And they've got the nerd bar, and they've got all these are the genius bar that they set up. And they've created this environment that in itself is representative of the culture of Apple. 
It is viral. It is cult-like. And I bring my kids to this restaurant, and there happens to be an Apple store near it where we live, and they insist on going on this in this uh, store, no matter what. And I'll tell you, they're the happiest when they, we walk into the restaurant and they say there's a 30-minute wait. I'm, I'm like starving. They're just like, cool, we get to go back to the Apple store. And they get to go back in and play with new devices and cool things, and it, it's fascinating. I mean, what other store, what other environment would be happy to see a 12-year-old or an 8-year-old playing around with real expensive electronics? I mean, that's the environment that they've created. And that is their business model in one small way. They have lots of components of their business model, but that is, that is why this example is up here. And I would say that innovation is one of the reasons Dell's losing money right now, and Apple is absolutely unstoppable. And you can think about all the other things they've done, technologically and otherwise. Uh, right up here in front. Yeah, this is interesting. So um, airlines alone is a massive case study. We could probably run an entire case uh, or an entire class on, air, on the airline industry and the innovation and emergence of airlines. And, and when I was in London for three years, it was even more interesting over there because we had Ryanair and EasyJet and a few of these others that were doing really cool innovative things where you can get on a flight for like 49 pounds and fly back and forth from London to Montpellier. And they had this cool model around going to these second and third market airports, which cut their cost by like 95%. And they did new things around the way they employed people. Um, this is an example where you have two totally different experiences. Where you have Southwest, which basically came out real strong and has done very well as the low cost provider. They have their specific hubs, they're very regionalized. You don't take Southwest to Asia. They're very regionalized. Their business model is driven by a couple of very important components, which is predictability, a good client experience, and it's all around low cost. Whereas you have Virgin, which has taken a totally different approach. Virgin said, we're not here to compete on cost. What Richard Branson decided to do was create the best airline that could be ever created. And he started with the quality of the airplanes, the seats, the TVs, the, the staff, right? The stewards and stewardesses. The entire experience is totally different. Try to find a really good quality, beautiful Southwest lounge and try to compare that to walking into the Virgin Lounge at London Heathrow. It's a totally different experience. You're not even on the plane yet. Then you get on the plane you get on the plane, especially the one to Asia, where you get the big body planes, they have a bar with bar stools between business class and first class where you can sit during that 18 hour flight. Southwest, different model, right? We're not here to be pretty, we're here to be effective, efficient, low cost. So these are different companies that have, that have competed in a totally different way. And they've done so in a very successful way. They're not going after the same market. They serve their niche, and it's very, very, very successful for both of them. So that's a good example there. And boy, airlines are a fantastic example because of all the successes and failures and other things. And you also have other residual effects, right? So one of, the, one of the reasons you do see the emergence of new airlines on a regular basis is because, quite frankly, it's a lot cheaper to run a new airline than it is to run an old airline, right? Why would that be? Unions, right? Uh, unions are a big part of it. It's also a lot more expensive to maintain old planes. And the unions have such residual costs built into them that you wind up, you take a company like United, uh, United has billions of dollars of obligation to retirees and pensioners and people that aren't even there anymore. So you could start an airline tomorrow and you essentially have a clean slate. And you can get away with not unionizing. You're even in better shape. That's probably not going to happen. Um, but there's different things to think about as you uh, build a business. What are, what are the ways you compete? And cost might be one and other things. Other comments or questions? Yep. Uh, coming back to Apple versus Dell, uh, what are the different allies that you could be doing on this platform? Would you guys either change the business model or it seems like you're fixing the business model that they have and having their small effect on the market? No, if I really had that answer, you know. Probably just 
give advice to Dell and, and, and retire, um, or I'd be an investor in my own fund. I'd, I'd be able to then invest in Bridgewater, be one of those 200. Um, so uh, just from a surface level, I think there's a few things that Dell, and, and I'm saying this not from my own experience, um, from the standpoint of investing in Dell, um, but from the standpoint of just looking at what's happened to their stock as well as looking at the trends of the past, right? And the past is a wonderful indicator of the future. If you look at why other successful, past successful companies failed in the computer business, it was innovation around the product, the technology, and the way in which they approached the market. They just couldn't keep up. If you look at companies like IBM or HP, the reason they have just struggled is because of exactly those reasons. They're selling the same box that looks the same, feels the same, acts the same through the same channel that they were 10 years ago. It's a total failure to innovate and failure to execute. There was a company up here on uh, Route 12895 called Nixdorf Computers. Ultimately, it was acquired by a company called Siemens. This company was building really big computers. These were like server-based computers. These things were boxes. And as the market changed and processors got smaller and computers got smaller, this is a German company. They built a computer. These are servers, right? They weren't laptops. They built a, I mean, you could drive over it in your car and the thing would still work. All of their competitors at the time were moving to super lightweight metals, smaller processors, more innovative ways. That was just one example. It had nothing to do with sort of the retail channel because they were selling to business. But it was an, an example of how they failed to innovate design and technology in such a way that ultimately they became extinct. They were, they were bought for change uh, by Siemens, and then became Siemens Nixdorf, and then they just killed the Nixdorf brand. And you see that again and again. So it's, it's, it's innovation at multiple levels, and I think for Dell, it's going to be innovation around both how they approach the market and also how they innovate the technology, because Apple, as an example, has built essentially a cult following. And Apple's also done something else really innovative, which is they have slowly brought people into the fold. So people like myself, who don't own an Apple computer, but I own two or three other Apple products. So they get you in, and then they have this magical connector. What, is, what do they develop that basically connects everything? See, I, all my music on my computer, which is a Dell, which is run by Microsoft, I'm even managing my life, my photos, my music with an Apple product. It's just a great way of syncing that hook and just slowly reeling you in. And you get the iPhone, and you get this, and then you get, hey, I need an iPad, you know, and before you know it, you know, my next computer will probably be an Apple. But it's, it's, it's fascinating just to think about how they've really innovated in the way that they capture a market. Wouldn't you think that it would be both at some level, right? It's, it's like your ability to cater to your client is going to be dependent, the, how, how long that relationship is going to be, is going to be primarily dependent about the quality of the product. Now, there's some companies that might make a trade-off, right, where they're not looking for a long-term relationship with their client. So think about products that we use, that we expect those products to wear out or expire over a period of time. They're not really thinking about that. Uh, in the same way as somebody that perhaps is selling, you know, a ten thousand dollar phone. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I would think most businesses at some level are thinking about both in a good way, um, but they might be discounting one or the other based on the market that they're going after. Yeah. So the question was, Citibank and American Express, and sort of what's the difference there? And you can sort of interchange. Uh, Citibank with anybody. So I don't want you to focus on Citibank. I don't really care about Citibank. It could be Capital One or it could be whatever uh, other card you have in your wallet. Um, but I want to compare those kind of cards against American Express. So this is a, this is a good example, uh, again, of almost the Apple 
model of you're going to build a cult following, and you're going to do it little by little by little, right? So I'll ask some questions around this instead of sort of throwing out my hypothesis. Um, what do you know about American Express cards, like from the standpoint of what colors do the cards come in? Blue? I haven't seen purple yet. That's good. Do they have a purple card? Wow. That reminds me of a whole discussion around sort of clothing labels and the different, we, we could touch upon it if we don't run out of time. So you have gold. What's the other one? All right, the clear, the platinum. The black card, all right. Otherwise known as the Paris Hilton card. So think about it just in these three chunks, right? Four chunks. Or you got the black card, the platinum card, the gold card, and the green card. All right. The green card is what? Like a starter card, right? It's like getting that little tiny iTunes, whatever the heck you call those little nano things, right? It's the starter. They get the hook into you. You get that green card, you feel good, like, hey, I got American Express. It's a green card. I right, can't wait to get the gold card. What do they put on the face of that card? Besides the account number, your name, and the expiration date, what do they put on the card? Member sense, right? So think about it. It says member sense. Like, I don't get that on my Chase Visa, right? I can get that on my American Express card. It says member sense. So I've now entered a club, a semi-exclusive club, because not everybody has one of these cards. And then, as you make more money, you get out of Sloan, you pay off all the debt you accumulated here, you get a gold card, guess what's still on there that stayed the same? Member sense. And now it's kind of cool of these. Before, it used to say 2010. And now, it says 2010, but the card is gold. And it's really 2013, and I'm now a member. I don't want to break that chain. And now guess what I also have the privilege of? I have the privilege of, instead of paying $49 a year for the green card, I get to pay $250 a year because they change the color of my card. I don't know what their cost is to do that, but my guess is it's not $100 or $200. So they've got me sucked in the way Apple does. And now I got the gold card, and my next goal is to get to the platinum card. And then, of course, at that point, I'm totally screwed because now I'm paying $700 a year for the privilege of this thing, and it's $350 for each extra card. And you know what? I'm not going to break the chain. What am I going to do? Cancel the card? They're going to reset my date back to zero. I mean, how shitty would that be? So I am sucked into that, and it's magical. Whereas Citibank versus Barclays versus Capital One, it's totally interchangeable. The color of the card is absolutely irrelevant. It depends what promotion you, an, uh, you, you uh, answer to. The variability in interest rate, variability in your annual fee, whether they waive it, 0% for 12 months or not, it is total marketing to the masses. It's mass marketing in the most elegant way. They look at you, they look at your profile, they figure, all right, we want this guy as a client. He's lower risk. We're going to give him 0% interest for a year. We're going to have no fees for one year. Boom. Somebody else applies for a card randomly, they're going to wind up paying $49 a year, and they're going to be at 17.99 day one. But they're a higher risk client, they make that adjustment. So think about it. Just, it's so different. It really is. And American Express does it in a very elegant, very, very cool way of roping you in, especially to the, to the main card. When you get to the blue cards and the other stuff, now they've got a business card, and they've got one that actually operates like a credit card where it's not expected to be paid off uh, in a short period of time. But in general, just think about their initial business model and how cool that was. That, you know, green, gold, platinum, and then black, and everybody else is just plastic noise that are competing on interest rates and lower fees. And that's just the magic of those two different models. And on the surface, if you didn't know any better, if you just dropped down from Mars, they just like plastic credit cards in someone's wallet. There's really no difference. Does that help answer the question at least? Right. Any other questions? How am I for time? OK, great. I just want to see if I skipped anything or any questions. These are the other great examples that actually last year I had so many of these, I think I had too many. So I just had a few examples here of just uh, sort of the fascinating dichotomy of having really same products sold in such ridiculously different ways. 
So, you know, you take your standard coffee maker, you know, versus like a Keurig coffee maker, where I can go into Sears and I can buy this one up here on the top left for about $9.99 to like $14.99, or I can buy the Keurig one down here for about $199. Or if I want, I can go to the Nespresso and I can spend $1,400 and get one of the really cool ones that has the little frothing thing. And of course, they've got to pay George Clooney's salary. So the fact that I've got a product that George Clooney endorses makes it worth the extra fourteen or $1,300. So think about it. What do these products do? They make coffee, all right? I don't even drink coffee, and I'm tempted to buy this one. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It's marketing and positioning. Um, we have an office in Singapore for Rhapsody, and one of those very cool malls off of Orchard Road uh, in Singapore, it's the Ion Mall, which is one of the coolest, most modern places. I can see a few of you have been there. It, they have a shop that is an espresso shop. It was the first time I'd seen one. There's more of them now. But it was fascinating to go into this shop, and they had colorful coffee makers on glass shelves all over the place. It looked like an Apple store. But they were selling coffee makers and, of course, giving away free coffee. And you think, like, what a marketing play. Do you think you could pull that off if you were selling a $14 coffee maker? This goes back to the design question. I mean, that is disposable. Right? You're going to buy that. You're going to buy another one in 12 months. And you're probably going to buy another one 14 months later. I mean, this thing better last. Totally different model. We talked about watches before, so I won't beat this one again. But that's a great example. When you go to the super high-end watches, like an IWC watch, that might cost eighty or ninety thousand dollars, and it took one and a half man years to make with very precious metals, versus, you know, a Swatch watch or a Movado watch, which you could buy one of them for one hundred and fifty bucks and another one for a thousand dollars. That's a big difference. And then you jump to the stratospheric level, where they are going after a niche within a niche within a niche. It's high net worth, people who appreciate watches. And when you get to this point, it's not even a watch anymore. It's a timepiece. You're not allowed to call it a watch. <laughs> you got to be very careful about that. It's all marketing. right? If you're going to wind up selling this, man, you cannot say, we're, we're, we have a watch company. We, we do quality timepieces. Um, so I'm going to sum everything up here. And uh, so we capture these first things that I talked about earlier today was sort of around the value proposition. It's number one. And then you really get into the real details of it. How do you segment the market, the value chain? How are you thinking about the competitive strategy? But also keep in mind where you are as a company is going to really determine how effective you are in building that business model and approaching multiple models. But keep it simple. And thank you all for your time.